Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Logic. Uh, this is on Truth Tables if you have your textbook. Where's my other textbook? Here. Open with me to 6.2 and the Hurley. This is on Truth Functions. Uh, I've actually recorded this lecture. I'm re-recording it because um, the Zoom had a, the mic was muted. So I get to do this twice. But you should enjoy this. This is one of my favorite sections. So here we go. Six, 6.2. All right. So we already learned in 6.1, if you come up here, I'll just review this real quick. Reach up. Oh, that's 5.7. I always go too far with this stuff. We're in the propositional logic. We already talked about symbols and Translations, we went over the operators, talked about simple statements versus compound, and we're going to obviously, as each section goes on, it builds on the previous one. Those simple statements versus compound are going to become really important in 6.2. That's why it's building on 6.1. Here we have the compound statements, if you remember that. We had our logical operators, the tilde, the dot, the wedge, the horseshoe, and the triple bar. What those logical functions are and how we translate that. It's not the case, not for the tilde. And also, moreover, one thing that was confusing is that with the dot, or the, what's known as the conjunction, that's also translated, uh, we would take but which seems to be a disjunction, but it's not. I'm trying to think of the other, however, but logically that's actually function as a conjunction of too simple into a compound. We have the wedge, the disjunction, or unless horseshoes the implication. Sometimes you'll see this as an arrow, but we're using the the horseshoe, if then, only if, and the triple bar. Moving on. And there we just have, it's not the case that E, B, and C, or both B and C, either P or M. If I, then A, G, if and only if G. Now remember with those capital letters there, those stand for simple statements. So if we went back, E for Emily Bronte wrote Jane Eyre, then the simple statement is, it is not the case that Emily Bronte wrote Jane Eyre. And that's just tilde E. The Boston Symphony will perform Mozart and the Cleveland Symphony will perform Strauss. Now, just to illustrate, if I put the, uh, grammatically, if I put the word but in there, you'll see how that logically functions. Not to just join the two, but conjoin. The Boston Symphony will perform Mozart, but the Cleveland Symphony will perform Strauss. That would be the same as if I moved... Actually, here's a better case. Let me go down. <laughs> there was one that was sticking out in my mind as far as as an example. It's always good to pull up the
That one's don't confuse those forms. You'll remember that. Oh, where was that example? I might just have to come up with one off the top of my head here. If I can't find, if I can't find the one I'm looking for. Suppose it was Ford builds trucks, but Chrysler builds trucks. That's the same as saying that both Ford and Chrysler big build trucks. Obviously this example is minivans right here. Um, I don't think I need to go over all of this because the previous lecture was on 6.1. What is going to become important, I want you to keep in your uh, mind, is main operator, because in 6.3, we're going to actually do logical truth tables. And with the logical truth tables, there is an order of operations. So you need to think in your mind, you need to break these things apart and be able to understand which one's actually doing uh, the main work and then the entire compound statement, which one is doing the main work. That ends up becoming what we call the main operator. Um, real quick, just make sure that, all right, we're back. Let me just pop this capture back up here. And again, I'm just reviewing the 6.1. And here you have in the textbook an example of all of which are conjunctions, which the main operator is the conjunction there. Oh, here's the one that I was thinking of. Honda and Suzuki build motorcycles. That is equivalent to the statement Honda builds motorcycles and Suzuki builds motorcycles. Don't get that confused with statements like Mary and Luis are friends. That's not equivalent to the statement um, Mary is a friend and Luis is a friend. So be careful when translating those. We probably won't run into those issues, but just going forward, The unless, um, and here are examples in which the main operator is the wedge, the disjunction. Implication, and I've said a little bit about the implication um, and necessary and sufficient conditions. And these are just examples where the main operator is the conditional, the horseshoe. And speaking of a sufficient and necessary condition, event A is said to be the sufficient condition for B whenever the occurrence of A is all that's required for the occurrence of B. On the other hand, event A is said to be the necessary condition for B whenever B cannot occur without the occurrence of A. I always use uh, cake and eggs, flour, and butter, but here we have having the flu is a sufficient condition for feeling miserable. Why? Because if you have the flu, you're going to feel miserable. But I can't go the other way. So notice that's why the horseshoe is kind of pointing to the right. The logical implication goes one way. Flu will g on the left, if I put that on the left, would give me the feeling bad on the right or miserable. But I can't go the other way. Feeling miserable doesn't mean a guarantee that I have the flu. There's many other ways to feel miserable. Um, Air to breathe is a necessary condition for survival. 
The one I use is eggs, flour, butter are necessary conditions for having cake. But just because you have those doesn't mean you have cake. The cake is a sufficient condition for having those necessary ingredients. Oh, here, cool, they put it in. The mnemonic device sun may be conveniently used to keep this rule in mind. Turning the U sideways, you see where are sufficient and necessary, the S and N's there. So look, Hilton's opening new hotel is a sufficient condition for Marriott's doing so. So there I would have H, horseshoe, M. Where H is a sufficient, M is the necessary. Why? Because Marriott opening a new hotel doesn't mean Hilton does, but Hilton's opening sufficiently determines that Marriott's. So just look at that. Um, we talked about if and only if logical equivalence there. All right. With the biconditional. And I want to get to, oh, this is good too. Remember this. Do not confuse these statement forms. A if B is written B implication A. A only if would be A implication B. And A if and only if B is A triple bar B. All right. I think that's good on that. This just gives some. Read that, De Morgan's rule. Not both S and T's, you write it like this. And again, we're gonna use all of this stuff in 6.2 and 6.3 and, and, and later on. Not both S and T. So notice you have the tilde there, and then the brackets S and T. This statement's logically equivalent to not S nor not T. In other words, not both Stephen and Thomas were fired is equivalent to the meaning either Stephen was not fired. So you see that either Stephen was not fired. So let me go back. Both, or it's not the case that both of them that's logically equivalent to saying, well, either Stephen wasn't fired, oops, or Thomas wasn't fired. Do you see how that works? That's called De Morgan's rule right there, so keep that in mind. And it's not equivalent to Stephen was not fired and Thomas was not fired. In other words, not S and T is not equivalent to not S and not T. Now you might get confused on that, because like an algebra, it would seem like that not was distributed there, but you have to think about things in terms of their logical meaning. And so that wouldn't be the same. And also to say that not either S or T um, is logically equivalent to not S and not T by De Morgan's rule. So again, it's not equivalent to say not S or T is not equivalent to not S or not T. Okay, I think we got that pretty straight. And here are some examples here. And let's go to 6.2. That's what I wanna to get to. Truth functions. All right, so here you have a definition of truth value of a compound proposition expressed in terms of one or more logical operators says to be a function of the truth values of components. What does that mean? Well, when we're looking at those compound propositions, 
the entire truth value of that compound proposition is going to be determined by the truth value of its components. And as we'll see in this section in 6.3 when we're doing truth tables, that if I plug in, if I know of my components what the truth value is, and I start calculating the rest of them, I can figure out, by what I'm gonna give you today, what the entire truth value of the compound proposition is. Because I can calculate it from the definitions of the logical operators. Okay. What's moving on? This is important too. The definitions of logical operators are present, uh, presented in terms of what's called statement variables. And we'll use lowercase letters for that, for like P, for example, P, Q, R, S. Those can stand for any statement. So the statement variable P could stand for the statement A, could stand for If A, then B. They could stand for B or C. They could stand for A, if and only if B, and so on. So we're going to be using these. Those statement variables can stand for any of those statements. We already learned all of those in 6.1. So for example, says a statement form is an arrangement of statement variables and operators such that the uniform substitution of statements in place of the variables results in a statement. What are you talking about? Well, for example, not P and P, if P then Q are statement forms because substituting the statements A and B in the place of P and Q respectively results in what? Not A, see that? And if I replace that, then it would be if A then B. Got it? Because we're gonna use those right here for what's called truth tables. So, the arrangement of truth values is going to be determined by this truth table. And I'm going to go from the simplest the negation to the conjunction to the more, and so on. Okay, so. What you're going to do is you're gonna write this little table right here. You have P. P can stand for anything. Any, any statement as we saw up there. Negation just means not P, so whatever that And negation is the opposite value, the opposite truth value. So that means if I have a statement, suppose Richard Wagner wrote operas. Now it's going to stand for R, but like I said, P can replace that. If that is true, then to say it's not the case, either not P, means that that value would be false and vice versa. If Richard Wagner wrote operas, if we're using that is R and that's gonna be replaced with P right there. If that statement's false, then it's 
not P, that entire statement right there is going to be true. That's all it means. Pretty straightforward. And that's what this is just explaining right here. The first statement is false because R is true, and the second is true because P is false. So just keep in mind, negation is it has the opposite truth value. Let's see. So far, so good. If so, we will move on. Now, this is some of my favorite stuff, by the way, especially when do, doing the truth tables. Um, we'll have that. I'll probably upload a lecture uh, Wednesday, maybe, on that 6.3, where we'll analyze statements. Um, we'll eventually learn how to test for validity using these. And look, you can always use your book. It's not like you have to have these tables memorized, but you will reference them. I mean, after doing enough problem sets of this, it's just like second nature and you can, you just know exactly what, what those are and you pop them in my truth tables. Okay, let's, and if I put up here real quick, just as I have a little, what's my call it? PowerPoint here. So let me just summarize real quick. In the PowerPoint, which is up on the site. A truth function is a co any compound proposition whose truth value is completely determined by the truth values of its components. Bingo. We talked about the definitions of logical operators are presented in the forms of statement variables, which are the lowercase letters that can stand for any statement. And A truth table is an arrangement of truth values that shows in every possible case how the truth value of a compound proposition is determined by the value of its simple components. Now I've just gone over the negation, but you'll see that we'll go over conjunction, disjunction, conditional, i.e. material implication, and biconditional. And you'll see on these charts that whenever I plug these in, it'll determine exactly what on the right-hand side that is for the compound proposition um, what those values would be for conjunction, disjunction, conditional, biconditional. We just did negation. All right, now let's just go back to the book. Right there. And here we go. <clears throat> now we're going to do conjunction. Remember the dot, the operator? So when I'm given, so that entire conjunction right there, P and Q, is going to be determined by the truth values of P and Q. Unlike the previous one, there's only two possibilities. The P is true or false. Why? Because I only have one variable right there, P. And because negation is the opposite, then when my P is true, my not P is false, and vice versa, when my P is false, my not P is true. But here we have two variables, P and Q. So, what I have is more possibilities. Oh, whoops, I went too far. I'm just going to use this. I have four possibilities. 
I have the first possibility in which P and Q are both true. Second possibility is P is true and Q is false. Third possibility is P is false and Q is true. And finally, the last possibility is that P and Q are both false. So what happens when for the conjunction Well, think about it this way. To say both P and Q is to say they're both having, they're both true. Um, that's exactly what it says here. This true table shows the conjunction is true when it's two conjuncts are true. It's false in all other cases. So just think about it this way. If P and Q are true, is the statement that both of them are true, true? Yes, true. If P is true and Q is false, is the statement, the conjunction, both P and Q are true, true? No. Well, what about if P is false and Q is true? No. And if they're both false, is the statement, they're both true, true? No, it's false. And we use ordinary language to see exactly how this is possible. Claude Monet and Vincent van Gogh were painters, C and V. So if it's actually true that Monet was a painter and Vincent van Gogh, then yeah, the whole statement, the conjunction is true. See how that works? Well, wait a minute. What if Monet was a painter? True. Van Gogh wasn't. Was the entire conjunction, they were both painters? True. No, because Van Gogh wasn't. And vice versa, if Monet was a painter, wasn't a painter. So that's false. But Van Gogh was, then no, this entire conjunct right here obviously is false. What if they were both, what if it was both false, but neither one of them were painters? Could this be true? No. So that's really nice. We can look at ordinary language to actually, because that's what's, you know, shows us intuitively what's going on here. In this chart and it just gives other examples here Monet and Beethoven were painters Beethoven and Brahms were painters there you have that and so notice again the first part of this section I can take C or V C or L L or J and I use those P stands for those uh, state those simple statements right there and then you just go to your truth table to look. Disjunction. It's an either or. The way I like to think about it is with the disjunction, at least one of them has to be true. So the disjunction is determined by its components, P and Q, here. Again, we have four possibilities. P is true, Q is true. P is true, but Q is false. P is false, but true, uh, Q is true. Um, and then a situation they're both false. So if you understand the disjunction is at least one is true, then look, is at least one true in the first line when its component parts P and Q are true? Yes. What about when P is true and Q is false? Yes, one, at least one is true. What about vice versa, P is false and Q is true? Yes. What if they're both false? No. Because it's saying at least one of the disjuncts is true and that otherwise it is false.
We call um, the street functional interpretation of the or is that of what's called inclusion disjunction. Cases in which the disjunction is true include the case when both disjuncts are true. Um, this inclusive sense of or corresponds to many instances in ordinary language. Let's look at it. Either Jane Austen or Rene Descartes was a novelist. So we know from the previous chapter that I would represent that as J or R. But now my J or R can be represented by P or Q. So it's including at least one of them, right? So we go back up here. It's true that Jane Austen is a novelist, and it was true that Descartes, then yeah, that would be true. Descartes wasn't a novelist, so we'd have here false and true. That statement, that either or, the inclusive sense, would be true. In fact, all of them would be true, except for this last. Third is false, because neither is included. Got it? Now, why would I bring up the no, the word inclusive? Inclusive as opposed to exclusive. Let's look what exclusive is and you'll know exactly what. Because they're different and you gotta keep this straight in your head. Otherwise you'll you'll mess up later on. As it says here, the match between the truth functional definition of disjunction ordinary language is not perfect. There's cases where, as we see up, that aren't going to match that truth table, or the, what's it called in the inclusive sense. We say, like, well, sometimes we use or in an exclusive disjunction. And here would be examples, and you'll see how this doesn't work with the above analysis. The Orient Express is on either track A or B. You can either have soup or salad with this meal. Now notice it's exclusive because with these, I could have them both be true and that statement would be true. That doesn't work with the exclusive disjunctive. Disjunction. The Orient Express is either on track A or track B. Yeah, both. It's on both. That's a true. It's ex excluding one or the other, right? Same with this one. Or Tammy's either 10 or 11 years old. So if I represented that as P is Tammy's 10 and Q is Tammy's 11. And it's not going to map on to this. So just keep in mind that just because in ordinary language you see an or doesn't mean you immediately go to this. You have to th uh, true table of disjunction and think it's all going to work out. You have to think in your mind in the ordinary language is it including, is it inclusive or is it exclusive? Strictly either. You got to pick one or the other. Okay, um, what else should I say about this? Oh, this is good. Really, if I wanted to actually translate this in, so notice it said here, the match between the truth functional definition of disjunction ordinary language is not perfect, something like that. If I wanna make it perfect, if I wanna retranslate that logically, it would actually be this. either A or B and not, so I, I'm talking about exclusive disjunctives. How would I translate that then? I couldn't just use either P or Q or either A or B. What these logically mean is something like this. Either A or B and not 
both A and B. See how that works? It's either A or B. Orient Express is either on track A or it's on track B, but it can't be on both. Either you have soup or salad, but not both. <coughs> Tammy is either 10 or 11, A or B, but not both. Okay. Pretty good? Pretty straightforward on that. Let's go to the conditional. Um, unless there's any... I keep saying well, as if there's any questions, but this is a pre-recorded. We could build a time machine and come back and ask. All right. We pop up the... Conditional, the material implication. Okay, this one's tricky. There's one line on here that always trips people up. Um, I have a good way of thinking about this. I think the book might even use this example, but again, just like the other ones, uh, the other two, four possibilities for the components of the implication if P then Q. Here the components being P and Q. If P then Q is a true statement, obviously if both P and Q are true. It's line two that's gonna trip people up. People are always like, why come? Why come that's the case? I'll explain that later. Don't worry about it, not right now. But That implication is false when the antecedent, the component part P is true, consequent Q is false but if the antecedent i.e. P is false and the consequent Q true of its component parts there turns out the implication is true so it's those two people it's not until I'm plugging in an example that you'll see why that's the case but just looking at it as far as the truth table is almost like a formula, people don't get it. And then if they're both false, the implication uh, P or Q is actually true. Now, the best way that I like to think about this is suppose that the, my implication, if P then Q, stood for the statement, if you get an A on the exam, P will stand for you get an A on the exam. And let's say a Q stands for you get an A in the class. So that the entire compound is if you get an A on the exam, then you get an A in the class. I want you to think about it this way. If I, the professor, were to tell you that if you get an A on the exam, you get an A in the class, under what conditions would I be lying? Well, let's look at the component parts. Suppose it's true, you get an A in the, on the exam, P. And suppose it's true, Q, that you get an A in the class. Obviously, my conditional statement, if you get an A on the exam, you get an A in the class, is true. I didn't lie, I told the truth. But suppose you do get an A on the exam and you find at the end of the class, why well, didn't you get an A in the class? I'm a liar. See that? The statement, the implication was false under those conditions. Does that make sense? However, it's the uh, line three that trips people up. Suppose you didn't get an A in the exam and you found out you nevertheless got an A in the class. Would you be upset with me? Would you say, he was a liar? No, I didn't lie. Remember, remember son. 
right? If my P was an S and my Q is an N. So that shows me where my sufficient and necessary conditions are. Sufficient being the antecedent. That is one way for you to get an A. Just like one way of feeling miserable is to get the flu, but there's other ways too to feel miserable. My statement, if you get an A on the exam, you get an A in the class, I'm just telling you that's one way to get an A in the class. Perhaps, um, as people joked, what about bribery? What about blackmail? <laughs> no, that won't work, but you get the idea. So I'm not lying when I, you didn't get an A in, on the exam, but you still got an A in the class. Suppose you did X credits, but there was other, you know, the rest of the uh, your grades compensated, you still got it. It was just saying that definitely for sure, if you got an A in the exam and got an A in the class, you'd certainly, that my statement would be true, wouldn't it? Well, suppose that you didn't get an A in the exam and you found out that you didn't get an A in the class. Did I lie? No. I did not lie. That's the best way to think about it. And I think the book even goes into two tables shows that a conditional statement is false when the antecedent is true, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's consider some examples here. If Isaac Newton was a scientist, so was Albert Einstein. If Isaac Newton was a scientist, so was Emily Dickinson. Um, if Emily Dickinson was a scientist, then so was Albert Einstein. If E, then A. If Emily Dickinson was a scientist, then so was John Maysfield. Okay. Um, yeah, it does use the example I gave. If you get an A on the final exam, oh, sorry. We're not having a final exam, are we? Just another exam. Then you'll get an A for the chorus. And then notice the author of the book even says, under what conditions would you say that your instructor had lied to you? Clearly, if you got an A in the final exam, but you didn't get an A in the course, you would say that she had lied. Or he. I'm a he. This outcome um, corresponds to the true antecedent and a false consequent. On the other hand, if you got an A in the final and you got an A in the course, you'd say, well, yeah, I told the truth. True antecedent, true consequence. So you just look over that. It's exactly what I said. And um, I wouldn't have lied if you had a false antecedent, false consequent. You didn't get an A in the exam, final exam, and you didn't get an A in the course. All right, last one. Biconditional. Triple bar, that's the if and only if. Think about it this way, it's saying um, they'll have equivalent, see their material equivalents? Equivalent uh, truth values. Would that be true or false? So P and Q are true, yes but they're not equivalent here, so false. Um, they're not equivalent here, so false. They are equivalent here, they have two, excuse me, false values, so that's true. And yeah, that's interesting. So notice with the horseshoe, if you think about it like an arrow, it's only going one way. So, if Isaac Newton were a scientist, then so was Albert Einstein. It doesn't follow that if Albert Einstein was a scientist, so was Isaac Newton. Because look, it's going one way. The I is a sufficient condition that determines the consequent. The consequence is just seen as a necessary condition. I couldn't be having Isaac Newton be a scientist unless Albert Einstein was. But just because Albert Einstein's a scientist doesn't mean Newton is because 
the logical relationships determined from left to right. And that that's basically what you gotta think about it. But equivalence goes both ways. That's why it says the material equivalence. If P then Q, and if Q then P. For example, think about this. If I went back up, suppose my P and Q, P stood for um, dog and Q st stood for animal. So that um, if Fido is a dog, then Fido is an animal. But it doesn't follow, I can't go the other way. If Fido is an animal, then I know Fido is a dog. Or if it's an, a dog, it's an animal. It doesn't go the other way. Yeah, but if it's an animal, it's a dog. No. Why? Because there's lots of animals that aren't dogs. But suppose I had a situation in which it went both ways. Um, I'll use this one, and then we'll go into the other examples. If hmm, if this is H, I wish I had a cup. This is H two O. Then it's water. And if it's water, it's H two O. Why? Because there's a material equivalence. H two O and water are the same thing. So if we go back to the textbook here. We can see that if, if P and Q are either both true or false, then the statement if P then Q and if Q then P are both true. But if P is true and Q is false, it would be false, blah, 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 right. Thus, if I say P if and only if Q is true, when P and Q have the same truth values and false when they have opposite truth values. And look into ordinary language, I already give you one example, but George Patton was an army general if and only if Omar Bradley was. What that means is I could go both ways. So if George Patton was an army general, then Omar Bradley was. And if Omar Bradley was, then George Patton was. And then it would make sense when I go back to that. That that statement, George Patton was an army general if and only if Omar Bradley was, only ends up being true if either they're both true or they're both false, but not when they have opposite truth values. It's line two, line three. I hope that makes sense. Um, what is this one saying? Other biconditional statements having false components are obviously more obviously true. If I could do a Ross, remember a Ross Perot impersonation, I would. Um, but I can't. I'll, I just lost it. So I'll just read it. Ross Perot was elected president if and only if he received a majority of vote from the electoral college. That's a true statement. He wasn't, when he wasn't, obviously we know that he wasn't elected president. And when he obviously didn't receive the majority of the vote. That's an excellent way to see how that line four works. Ross Perot was elected president, P, if and only if he, Q, oops, what am I doing? Received the majority of the vote. He wasn't elected president and he didn't receive the majority of the vote, but clearly my statement going back here is true. Application to longer propositions. Yep, you're gonna get longer. They're gonna get much longer. Don't get scared, it's fun.
So you'll see this in 6.3. Okay, here I have three components, A, D, and E, of a more complicated expression, which says, if either A or D, then E. And I'm just going to give you a couple steps of when it gets more complicated like this, what steps to take. It's pretty easy if you just remember these. So it's showing here that suppose you're told in advance that A, B, and C are true and that D, E, and F are false. Then you're asked, well, how do I figure out the truth value for that compound proposition? Step one, write the truth values of the simple propositions immediately below the respective letters. So like I said, if you were told A, B, and C are true and D, E, and F are false of those letters, go, once you've written this out, either A or, if either A or D, then E, then go, well, I, I was told that A is true, so under there I'll put T or, and I was told D is false, F, and then under the E, I was told E was false. Okay. So now you have a compound statement that's like this. Next step. And this is like order of operations. That's why you had to like realize um, in the previous section what the main operator is. You work outward from what's in the parentheses because the main operator doing the, the majority of the work here of this entire proposition is not the disjunction, it's the implication. So don't start with the main operator. Start with what's in the brackets. Now I have a disjunction. Oh, I learned about disjunction. Come back up to your truth table for your disjunction right there. And you'll notice that if we come back, here are my P and Q's. <clears throat> my P is true, my Q is false. Remember what the disjunction says. At least one of them is true. This is an inclusive. Is at least one of them true? Yes, so put a T under the wedge. Because under those conditions, when those components where one is true and one is false, at least one is true, that's a true disjunct, the, the disjunction is true. So now my third line, I have an implication, true, where my P is true and my Q is false. And you go back to your disjunctive, sorry, uh, implication truth table to see in what case would the implication be true versus false. And we see here, as you had written down, we'll go back, that, wait a minute, I have my antecedent, I mean, my P is true, and my consequent, which we had F, is false. So that implication is false. So that's why under the main operator, the horseshoe, the implication, you put false and circle it. Three easy steps for more complicated expressions. If you're given the values, plug the values in, right? Then start number two, step two, start with the brackets and determine what the value of that would be. This is a disjunctive and with those values for its components, that would be true. 
then I have the implication, the third line, in which case when the, that com the components are the antecedent is true and the consequence is false, then it's false. Um, what does it say? General strategy building true values of larger components. Individual letters represent a simple proposition. Um, these are, yeah, some other tips of or uh, like order of operations. You start with individual letters representing simple propositions. Two tilde's immediately preceding individual letters. You go to that next. Then you would go to operators joining the letters or negated letters. Then you would move to tilde's immediately preceding parentheses and so on. So let's look here, for example. Let there be A, B, and C is true and D, E, and F is false. Of the statement, either both, sorry, um, if both B and C, then E or A, okay? Plug your values in. Start with the individual uh, letters representing simple propositions, up, 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 up there. I don't have any tilts. So I don't need to go to that step. Operators joining letters, yes, I do. So in the brackets there, that's a conjunction. And it's saying both are true, both are true, yes. So put T under the operator there. This is an implication in which the antecedent is false and the consequence is true. If you go to your true table, you realize that implication is true. So put that under. And finally, the main operator, if the antecedent is true, then the consequence is true? Yes, circle that, okay. Let's see if they give us another example. Yeah, good. So this one will give, using the tilde. Okay, so for this one, not C or not, sorry, if not C or not A, then not B. Okay, go to step one. Put in your truth values for simple letters. Now imagine we're still using uh, where A, B, and C are true and D, E, and F are false. Okay, so I'm gonna do that. Under my C, I put T. Under my A, I put T. And under my B, I put T. Okay, go back up to step two. Then move in your order of operations. Tilde's immediately preceding individual letters. Immediately preceding. Okay, I'm not going to do that one. It's not immediately preceding because it's in brackets. This one is immediately preceding, and this one is immediately preceding. So remember with negation, it's just the opposite value. So if that value is true and it's saying not true, it's false. So under the tilde, put F. Same with this one. Under the tilde, put F. Okay. Then it says, move to operators joining letters or negated letters. Um, now, so go to four. Tilde's immediately preceding parentheses. Okay. Here's one, a tilde immediately preceding the parentheses. Oh, sorry, uh, excuse me, we forgot to, we forgot to do this. So now that I have true or not true, I true or not false, that's a, a, a disjunction. And it's saying at least one's true, yes, okay. So now step four, move to the tilde immediately preceding the parentheses, not true is false, so put under the tilde, because that's the one doing the work, false. Now you've got an implication, your final line to look at, which is your main operator. If P then Q, where P is false and Q is false, I know that in that implication it's still true. Remember, um, if you get an A on the final exam, then you get an A for the course, but I didn't get an A 
in the exam and I didn't get an A in the course, I still told the truth. Whoa, look at this one. It looks intimidating, but it's not if you follow these simple rules. We're going to still use where we let A and B, A, B, and C be true, and D, E, and F false. Okay, put the values under what? So we'll go back to step one. The individual letters represent in simple propositions. That's my D, F, B, A, F, and C. D is false, F is false, B is true, A is true, F is false, and C is true. Then step two, go immediately to determine uh, the truth value of the tilde's immediately preceding the individual letters. That would be here and here. So not true is false. So put false under the tilde. Not true is false. Put false under the tilde. Okay. Then determine either the conjunction or disjunction in the brackets. Okay. So I'm looking at this, the, and this. And then um, I can look at the operation here. But let's do this first. Okay. Remember, it's a disjunction saying in one, at least one is true. Is at least one true? Nope. So under the tilde, put false. Here's another disjunction. Which disjunction uh, statements say at least one is true? Is at least one true? Yep. So put true under the wedge. Okay. And then you can go to the implication. Antecedents false and consequence false. It's still the implication is true. Okay, so now I've got true, true, false. Okay, go to the tilde that immediately precedes. There. Not false is true. So now I have true and true. And then not true is false. Got that? Let's go into the brackets. This is a conjunction saying both are true. Yes, both are true. Now I have an implication. I'm looking at the main operator right there. The antecedent is true, but the consequent is false. Nope, that's the one I know that's false. Um, it's a second approach here. Sometimes I use colored pens too that help. Um, this this approach says if preferred the truth values of the compound components may be entered directly beneath the operas without using a line by line approach. If you can do that, if you want to you do whatever works for you, don't get messed up. But that would be the second approach. I don't have to write, write line by line. I think when you get better, you get more familiar, you'll start doing something like this. Um, but to not get confused, you could do this. But for example, if I didn't do line by line, I would do this. A is true, D is false, C is true, B is true, A is true, D is false, C is true, E is false. And then I immediately go to the tilde. Not true is false, put a false there. Not false is true, put it true there. Not true is false, put it false there. Okay. Then work within the parentheses. So now I'm looking at false value and false value. It's a material implication saying both values, so yeah, I'll put true there. Okay. Then I go to this one, work within the parentheses. Not, f sorry under the tilde, false and true. Is that, now that's a conjunction. And it's saying both are true, but my values is true and false, so no, that's false. Here I have an implication. 
where my values are. I'm trying to underline this for you so you can see, but the computer is not acting correctly. True and true implication is true. Material equivalence, no. Okay. Now I'm looking at this value and then my main operator here. And now I'm looking at it's an either or. At least one of them's true, yes. So here under the tilde, I put true. Okay. Then I come here. My if my value here was false under my main operator of this left hand side, then not false is true. And now I'm looking at a conjunction, right? Are both true? Yes, so true. So now. See, this is more complicated. I'm better at it, but I you know I do this. As I'm saying, you might not be able to do this single line till later. I'm trying to underline this or highlight it. What in the world? Now I'm looking at this on the left-hand side of the um, triple bar. And I'm looking at, since I negated the or as F, I'm looking at a, a material equivalence between true and false. Are they both? No. So if you could do it, that's the second approach, you would do it in one line like that. Um, I definitely recommend if you do that, use multicolored pens so you know which. <laughs> And again, this is, you could look through this. I'm not going to go through all of that, but that's another single line approach. In which this case, because look at the, the brackets, they go all the way out here. So it's the tilde that's the main operator there. And once you compute all of that, just in the way that I did or the, the previous ones, you'll see that for that entire compound statement, the value when a, B, and C are true, and um, e, D, E, and F are false, that that entire compound statement will be false. Um, let's see, here's just one last statement, and then I'll finish up here. This car is ugly, but it's economical to drive. That's So that's what I was hinting at earlier in the lecture you would still use, you think in ordinary language they're being pitted against each other, but they really mean is that the car's ugly, right, is true, and it's also economic to drive, is true. The car is economic to drive, but it's ugly. So there we go. Another instance where the truth function interpretation of and differs from ordinary language meaning is often the slang term is like, you go for that gun and you'll regret it, son. That's a sense if P then Q. But notice in ordinary language, I'm using a conjunction. So just keep those things in mind. It doesn't always. And here's another one. where we talked about exclusive disjunction. And the following sentence, unless, has an inclusive sense. You won't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. It will not rain unless there are clouds in the sky. And you see with this case here, it has the meaning of buying a ticket It includes the case of buying a ticket and not winning. But the second one includes the case of where there's being clouds and no rain. All right, I think that's pretty straightforward. What else? Here's some more ex conditional statements. They clearly remain true even if the antecedents might be false. If the temperature rises above 32 degrees, then the snow will begin to melt. 
So the antecedent might actually might rise above 32, so that would be false. Because I've seen that happen. It's not melting. Mm. Um, or this, if figure A is a triangle, then figure A has three sides. But it might not be a triangle. And see, it might be false. If all A are B's and all B's are C's, then all A's are C's. So it's just giving you some examples there. And I think that's it. No, there's more. If Shakespeare wrote Hamlet and the sunrise in the east. Um, these are good because it shows that there's no actual logical inference. So just because you see an if then does in ordinary language doesn't mean that it's expressing a logical inference and it gives us two examples here. If Shakespeare wrote Hamlet and the sun rises in the east. If ice is lighter than water, then ice floats um, does express a necessary connection, doesn't it? Uh, this is a statement the, the author brings up. The fact that a material conditional ignores inferential connections between antecedent and consequent allows for conflicts between truth functioning interpretations of conditional statement in, and the ordinary interpretation. If Barbara Boxer advocates the use of cocaine, then she is a good senator. <laughs> you gotta love these examples they use in this book. If Chicago's in Michigan, then Chicago's very close to Miami. So according to the ordinary language interpretation, both these statements are false. Good senators do not advocate the use of cocaine in Michigan as far from Miami. Yet when these statements are interpreted as material conditions, they both turn out to be true. So that's just to illustrate some examples of where ordinary language and logic can conflict as far as the interpretation here. Here's some more examples where it says, while inferential relations between antecedent and consequent often play some role in conditional expression in, in the indicative move, as we played out, they play a dominant role in conditional statements expressed in the subjunctive move. So that if I were kind of, if I were the Sultan of Brunei, then I would be rich. If dolphins were fish, then they would be cold blooded. If Washington Monument were made of lead, then it would be lighter than air. If President Kennedy had committed suicide, then he would be alive today. Um, and then it says, with those, the only way of determining the truth value in ordinary language is through some kind of inference. Thus, our knowledge of the Sultan of Brunei is rich. We reason that if I were the Sultan, then I would be rich. Similarly, from our knowledge that all fish are cold-blooded, we conclude that if dolphins were fish, then they would also be Blooded. On the other hand, we reason the second two are false from our knowledge. Lead is heavier than air. And obviously, suicide causes death. And that's it. That is 6.2. And here I'm going to assign some exercises for you to practice. Obviously, we start with uh, now in. This is the older version. This is the 10th edition, and I have you using the 13th edition, so it's not going to match up. But you'll see with the examples are kind of similar. Um, section one is you're just identifying what the main operator is. And then you're going to write compound statements in symbolic form for section two. And then I guess you got to use your, your knowledge of historic events and plug those uh, the truth values in to determine, for the simple statements, to determine 
the entire value of the compound statement. And then, just like we did in the last examples, it's going to give you let A, B, and C be true, and X, Y, and Z be false. Clearly, this is super easy for the first ones. A is true, and X is false. That's a conjunction. So, if they're saying both are true, then they're not, so it's false. It gets more complicated when you get down to these. But if you follow those four simple steps that I pointed out, it's not going to be a problem. Here's some more examples. And then I'll do a lecture on 6.3, Truth Tables, which is awesome. Look at this. Wham! Isn't that fun? Are you excited as I am about learning about that? Okay, so that wraps up our lecture of 6.2 truth values and I will upload this for you. I did this as a live lecture on YouTube too so let's just check in to see. Whoa! I'm looking at all the, the chats to see what Again, I had to do this real quick. I'm gonna eat. I'm doing a um, a premiere in like 50 minutes from uh, Hotel and I. But what happened is I recorded this lecture already. It's really unfortunate that something went wrong with the Zoom, and probably the it was muted or the audio wasn't. So when I went to look at it, I noticed that there was no audio, and I man, I have to redo this lecture. So that's why I did. I just I had to knock it out because I need to upload this um, to Fullerton uh, tomorrow. So that's why I did. Sorry, I would have given more announcements more uh, earlier. Let's see what. Only four viewers. That's how excited the world is about logic. I'll tell you that. Four viewers. Uh, no, it doesn't touch on uh, normative logic. It's just pretty standard. Here, concise introduction. This is the 13th edition. Now, it's not going to look like this because it's my teacher's edition here. It probably looks something more like this here. There you go. Bob's your uncle. Um, Bob actually is my uncle. Bob, if you're watching, hey, Bob. And let's see if I just have any. If you would, like, subscribe, and thank you guys. I'm going to go eat dinner. And just wanted to throw out a free one for all the subscribers on YouTube. And Fullerton, you will get this uploaded, obviously, on Monday. Which you'll be watching this on Monday. All right. With that, I, I say uh, farewell to all of you. And uh, 6.3 for next time. Take care.